Merkel Media. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. But the giant moves, he's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody yells, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Welcome to the show, everybody listening to The Confessionals. I am your host, Tony Merkel. Thank you for being here. If you've had an encounter or a story you'd like to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. That's theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the contact section and you can reach me that way as well. Either way it works for me. Just get a hold of me. If you want more shows on a weekly basis, just go to theconfessionalspodcast.com. And hit the join button because that is where we offer exclusive members only episodes via the website and the app. We do have access to an app for listening pleasure for members. So if that's something that's been interesting you and you've been waiting for the app to drop, we do have an app available for you now and you'll receive instructions via email when you sign up to become a member on how to access member shows on the app. Now, we also have preparewiththeconfessionals.com. That's preparewiththeconfessionals.com. That is a prepare site that you can get yourself emergency food and survival gear. That's preparewiththeconfessionals.com. That is a great site to have as a resource to gather everything you need to survive emergencies. Preparewiththeconfessionals.com. Dot com. Now, I want to let you guys know that we also have the YouTube channel. I'm actually out of town right now as you're listening to this. I am not at home for this week, but I do have my laptop with me and I'm planning on finding some downtime where I can start editing some videos that we've already shot to release on the YouTube channel. So if you don't want to miss another episode of Legion of Legends, go to the Confessionals YouTube channel, hit subscribe, and there we'll be posting Legion of Legends whenever they are available. We are planning many, many more more trips, and we are looking forward to sharing what we discover with you. And last but not least, I want to let you know that I was a guest on two different podcasts last week. One was called Macro Aggressions with Charlie Robinson, and the other one was My Family Thinks I'm Crazy with my friend Mark. Those are two great podcasts. You should go check them out. And right now, you can listen to the episodes with me on them, talking about my journeys with Legion of Legends and also talking about some stories that we've heard about on this show. Very good conversations I had with those guys, and I appreciate them having me on. Now, this week, we have Joel coming on the show. This is an overtime time episode. The first hour, we talk about his paranormal experiences and his brother's paranormal experiences. When they were kids, they were walking to their babysitter's house just to pay her for babysitting them. It was not a long walk. They saw something during that walk that led to them having missing time to the point that when they got to her house, she was freaking out and their mom was freaking out because they were missing for a very long time. And they were obviously very relieved the kids were okay, but they had no clue that they were missing for a period of time. To them, the walk seemed normal, and that just starts us off. 
Then he goes into Dog Man, Bigfoot, a lot of different topics we talk about here. And then in the overtime, Joel talks about more of a personal journey he's been on as an adult. You see, Joel is an active practicing witch, and he comes on to share his experiences with witchcraft and what are the crazy things that he's been through since he's pursued witchcraft and why he continues to pursue it to this day. It was an awesome conversation I had with Joel, and I know you guys are going to love these conversations. So let's get to it right after this trailer for the overtime episode right now. So I I was having a a lucid experience. Um, I was, I was put forth, um, with the the task of protecting uh, some kids in a situation, um, I had to deal with a number of uh, <laughs> absolutely um, terrifying demonic entities. We'll we'll say, um, and like I'm talking, I've I've never had night terrors before. I'd had bad dreams before, but I never I never had night terrors until I started practicing witchcraft. This was uh, probably, this was like my first night terror. It was absolutely terrifying. Um, Anyway, um, at the end of it, I ended up, um, I saw this, this man in black was on this hill and he was, he was outside overlooking what was going on. And after I had dealt with these entities, I went up to the hill and I, I was pissed. I was I was freaking livid. And uh, I got up in his face, and he simply smiled. He didn't. He simply smiled, and he said, "Now, now you're ready to talk." And I said, "What?" He said, "Now you're ready to talk." I said, "I don't want to fucking talk to you. What you just put me through." And he just had a smile on his face, and he disappeared. I thought, what the hell was that all about? Oh, well, it wasn't until several months later um, that I was I was reading that that is one of his ways that he manifests is as a man in black, and what that that uh, <laughs> that episode that I had gone through that night terror that I had just experienced was him testing me to see whether or not I was ready to go on to the next level. All right, today we got Joel on the show. Joel, how are you, man? Well, I'm doing good, Tony. How about you? Uh, I'm doing good, man. As good as can be. It's uh, it's a crazy world out there, so I'm just trying to get by. Yeah, it's definitely something we're all trying to get used to. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, so, Joel, man, you have some really interesting experiences that I'm excited to hear you tell. Uh, and we're just going to start off from the beginning in your childhood, because actually, it, it sounds like your childhood starts off with a bang. So uh, you and your brother went through something that you're going to share with us that I think is uh, pretty phenomenal and in in not, not such a good way, just absolutely amazing way. Yeah, it was uh, definitely interesting to, uh, to say the least. Um, I'm from Canada and uh, up here in British Columbia. Um, I grew up uh, for the first part of my life up until my teens in Victoria and um, in this uh, particular instance, I was probably four or five, and then my older brother, he was about seven. And uh, we lived on a, um, it was a dead-end street. It was a long, long street. It wasn't a cul-de-sac, but it was a dead-end, and it was, uh, it was actually called Taunton Street in Victoria. And um, one night... My uh, my mother had asked us to um, to uh, walk up the street and drop off some money to the babysitter, 
And uh, it was late at night. Well, it wasn't late. It was dark. And um, and we lived in a two-bedroom bungalow, so it was a a small house. And there was a, I don't know, it was probably about a 30-foot walkway from the front of our house uh, to the sidewalk. And there was a little gate that opened up onto the sidewalk. And at the time, we had a puppy. So parents said, take the, uh, take the dog out with you so we can go to the bathroom. And so we walked up to the, uh, to the gate um, out of our yard, and I turned around to, to close the gate, and I noticed um, there was a white disc. Uh, and it was, from what I recall, it was the full size of the house. It went from end to end. Um, of our house. And I said to my brother, hey, what's that? My brother was like, oh, I have no idea. At the time, I immediately thought, because we had some teenagers that lived behind us, I thought, well, maybe it was, they were in their their backyard playing around with a flashlight or something. So we start walking, walking down the road. And it was only about four houses up, I think. But this disc, um, was following us. So it was flying over the other houses as we were going down the street. We get to the babysitter's house and they have a, uh, a covered porch on it. And, uh, and so as we're walking up, uh, up their walkway to their front door, the disc stops above this white light disc stops above the babysitter's house. So we ring the doorbell, and um, the babysitter's mother answers the door, and she says, um, uh, your mother called, and she's wondering where you guys have been. And so we kind of look at each other like, well, we're walking the dog. We just came here to drop off the money. And she says, well, you better hurry up on home. Your mom's getting worried. It's like, okay. Walk back up to the sidewalk. Oh, and we I, actually we had said to the uh, to the mom we said oh well there's this there's this disc that followed us, and she kind of shook it off and okay yeah yeah whatever, and she couldn't see it because of the covered the covered patio porch there. And so uh, we got back up to the sidewalk, and uh, my brother freaks out and he bolts. I'm like, what are you doing? Don't leave me here. And uh, and I had the little I had the I had the puppy. And my brother's like, forget it, I'm going. So he he takes off, and uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to wrangle the the puppy and to pick it up, because I don't want them, whatever they are in this disc, to to take take the dog. So now I pick up the dog and I'm running and I'm bawling my eyes out. We went back into the house, and uh, our mom starts giving us crap, right, yelling at us, "Oh, where have you guys been?" Uh, you know, I almost called the police. And we said, well, there's this, there's this white disc over, over the house that followed us there and back. And, uh, she, you know, she was uh, still freaking out. Hurry up and go have your bath. I don't want to hear your stories. I'm so mad at you guys right now. And, uh, and so that was, that was sort of the start of it. My brother and I, you know, still talk about it to this day. Um, but at the time, that was that was sort of the the end of the uh, the end of the episode, wow. in a sense. Let me ask you before you keep going here: uh, Did you happen to notice any difference in the dog? You know, I I really wasn't paying attention to the dog. Um, I was um, I was more paying attention on on the disc, right? And and one thing that occurred to me was, you know, after we got you know, one or two houses up the street. Um, I remember thinking it can't be a flashlight because a f- flashlight wouldn't shine that far ahead. And then not only that, a flashlight needs a surface to reflect off of to to give it shape, right? Um, and so I think that added to it, to the panic when my brother took off as well because I knew that it couldn't be the kids um, in the house behind ours playing with a flashlight so you're you're walking to the babysitter's house and as far as you know as far as you can remember 
you didn't, there was nothing different. I mean, you literally walked to the house, normal time, and somehow lots of time went missing. Well, yeah. And you know, the funny thing is it wasn't until I was in my thirties after listening, it was like a couple of days after listening to an Art Bell show that the whole missing time thing even occurred to me. Um, and when it did, that's sort of when I, it kind of creeped the hell out of me. Um, and I mentioned it to my brother and he's like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. So, um, now my parents got divorced when I was young. And so I never grew up with my father until I think I, I, think I was 17. We had, uh, we had reconnected. And, um, so we told, we told him about it and, uh, yeah, his, uh, his eyes lit up and his jaw almost hit the floor when we told him. And we said, uh, we said, oh, well, what, have you had a UFO experience? And uh, he took a deep breath and uh, he proceeded to tell us his story. And that had also occurred on Vancouver Island in, in Port Alberni before he had met our mother. Um he was at a uh, at a lookout point in Port Alberni uh, with his with his date. He said it was in the in the middle of winter, so there was snow on the ground, and um, he had the they were parked. The engine was running to keep the keep the cab warm. Both doors were locked, and he said he seen a um, they saw this bright light come down in front of the truck filled the cab with light. Uh, and then the next thing he knows, he was about a mile on, a mile away uh, from the truck, um, standing there by himself. Now, I guess when he was in the truck, when he had parked, he had taken his jacket off. So he was now a mile away in the snow, uh, in the dark, without a jacket on. So he makes his way um, back to the truck. and. Uh, the girl's gone. His date is gone. The truck is still running, and both doors are locked, right? So the keys are still in there. So he had to smash the window to get back into his truck. Um, went home, called the girl's house, and uh, the sister answered and said uh, uh, said uh, she didn't want to talk to him right now. Um, maybe uh, Maybe call in the morning. So he called her the next day in the morning, and the sister answered and says, uh, listen, um, I can't remember the girl's name. She said, she doesn't want to talk to you right now. She doesn't want to discuss last night, but you need to know that you didn't do anything wrong. Um, but she just doesn't want to talk about last night anymore. So shortly after, they ended up moving, and he never talked to her again until he was looking for work in Vancouver about 15, 20 years later, and he saw her on the street. And she recognized him and came up to him, and she was excited to see him and give him a big hug, and uh, they made some small talk for a bit. And he says, hey, um, do you remember that night when we went up to the lookout point? Um, and he says, I, I have no recollection of what happened, except I ended up being like a mile away from the truck. And uh, her face went completely blank. And she said, um, she says, I've spent years in counseling uh, trying to deal with what happened that night. But she says, I want you to know that you, you didn't do anything to me. Um, I don't want you to think that uh, um, I'm blaming you for, for what happened. But she said, I've, I've spent years getting therapy. And I've moved on with my life, uh, and that was the um, that was the last time uh, he ended up seeing her. No, um, no, I want to know what happened. <laughs> oh, I no know. way! So I, I, w I would like to look her up and and, and uh, talk to her. Unbelievable! No, I I want like she had to tell him what happened. Like he doesn't know what happened. Unbelievable! Unreal. <laughs> Yeah, talk about a cliffhanger, right? Yeah, it's the worst, man. I wish you wouldn't have started the show off with that. Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, so 
So that was kind of uh, that was kind of interesting to hear my dad's experience. Um, now, let's see. I got married when I was thirty-four, so I guess I was around just before. I'm, I think I had just turned thirty-four, or um, yeah, I was about 30, almost thirty-four, or I had just turned thirty-four, and. Uh, my wife and I were at work. We're bus drivers, and so we were we were in the sleep room and um, taking a nap. You know, they got Lazy Boy recliners there, so she's in she's on the left of me, and I'm in my Lazy Boy, and and um, we're gonna take a nap for a couple hours between our shifts. And uh, so I had a uh, I want to say I've 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 had lucid dreams. A ton, like they're quite frequent, as well as astral projection. But this was, uh, this felt like a lucid dream at first. Um, and so basically, what it was was I was uh, sitting in the in the in, in the recliner in the love in the love lazy boy, and um, I was suddenly outside of my body, looking at my work building. But there was like a silver, I don't know, it looked like a, it was like rice shape, you know, kind of like an oblong oval. And um, and it was above the sleep room outside of the building. So I'm outside observing this. And then the next thing I know, um, there's a beam of light. And I'm being pulled from my chair into this beam of light. But now I'm in my body and I'm experiencing it, and I hear these voices or this uh, these voices talking, and I hear the one say, um, "We have to do this quickly because he'll be having children soon." And uh, at that point, I felt um, oh, sorry, it's a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, Kind of like a pressure. I don't know if you've ever, if anybody's ever had like a large gauge needle um, puncture their skin, but I had that happen in my nether regions. Uh, we'll put it that way. Um, and I remember trying to scream, and I couldn't scream. And I, it, it wouldn't come out, but I felt the pain and the pressure. Um, and then the next thing. <clears throat> Light. So this was happening. I wasn't on a table or anything. I was still suspended in air in this light when this happened. Uh, and then the next thing I know, I'm out of the light and I'm physically, um, <clears throat> I don't know, I, I felt uh, falling about six, seven inches, I'm guessing, maybe a little bit more, into the Lazy Boy chair. And my arms were... My arms were straight up. My legs were straight up as if I had been dropped. Um, and I actually fell with force into the, into the chair. And, uh, and I was fully awake. And I, I looked over at my wife. She's still sleeping. Uh, and my heart was, was going a million miles an hour. So from that experience, what started off seeming like a lucid dream, which I had had before, um, to actual to an ending uh, when I was physically dropped into a chair, which made me realize, like, holy shit, was I just abducted? And I, I, I came to before, before I, I, I hit the chair. I don't know. Um, so that was the that was sort of the last of my UFO experiences that I've had uh, since before my kids were born. Wow. So what do you make of that? I mean, you, you have this abduction and you hear them say, we have to do this fast before he's going to have kids soon. You've had a lot of time to think about this. Do you have any theories as to what that was all about? You know, I, I think looking back in, in, in retrospect to my father's experience and from what I've heard from you know, other abductees is that it's a generational thing. I think, obviously, for, for what, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> that being said, my wife had a dream. I'll, I'll say dream. Um, 
It was probably, I think our youngest was just turned a year old. And she got up one morning and said, um, hey, you know, I've had a really, I had a really strange dream last night. There was a craft had landed in the common area. And the common area is like a small grass area with a couple benches in our townhouse complex. And the kids' room is right outside and it overlooks the common area. And she said this craft landed. And she said there were beings who were there to see how the children were doing. And she said, and then I woke up. That's all, that's all I remember. I've never had a UFO dream in my life. My wife has never had any before that, and she hasn't had any since. So that was, you know, that's been eight years since. So I don't know. That's just a big question mark. Do you think that that was an actual dream or she just thinks it's a dream? I think it was a real thing. Okay. I don't want to, I, I don't want to pry too much on that one. Yeah, no, I don't, I, you know, some of these things happen, um, and there's so many shifts of consciousness and how we perceive things. I don't know if it's happening interdimensionally or what, if it, or if it's part of the um, part of the process of how how our minds deal with things, or if it's a technology that they use to make it seem like it's a memory or a dream. I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, I reference this guy a lot when it comes to dreams because um he really knows what he's talking about uh, he has a youtube channel called mr x dreams and i had him on the show and he he specializes in this whole dream phenomenon if this has what you want to call it and mm -hmm. he firmly believes that dreams are not just this mental state where we go to and you know we just dream up storylines in our head while we sleep but he 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 believes that we're, we're going into other states of being and it's like, it, it's like a whole other reality. And he, he has an experience with his sister where they were both in the same dream and they both recall seeing each other in that dream. And <clears throat> so it, it, it's, it's really interesting to me. There's this whole aspect of stuff. And, and for somebody like me, I, I don't ever remember dreams ever. Uh, right. And so it's, it's really fascinating to me that people not only remember their dreams, I guess I'm an oddball, but uh, also have this interaction in their dreams that kind of play into this side of reality. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah. And, you know, I think there is, um, I'm of the mindset too, that when we dream or when we sleep, we actually leave our bodies and go back to where home is. You know, I, I guess because I'm of the belief of the uh, sort of of the Gnostic belief that this is a uh, more of a matrix that we're in. And I remember actually both of my kids when they were very young, different times, both by themselves. And they both asked me the same question. And I had the question, too, when I was a kid was what if this um, they said to me, um, Dad, what if this is all a dream and we dream that's actual reality? And they were asking me that at like four years old. And I, I actually, I kind of believe that, that that's, that's the truth. I think we've, uh, this is actually nothing but what we perceive as reality is actually a dream. And when we go to sleep, we leave our body and our souls are actually um, functioning or resting before we come back into these these bodies or these vehicles that we have to experience the simulation from. That's really interesting. And and I I I hear people's experiences and stuff and, and the more I hear people's experiences, the more I, I, I realize how strange what I perceive as reality to be. And there's times that it just happened last week. I'm standing in my kitchen by myself, my entire household sleeping. It was late at night, probably like one, two o'clock in the morning, drinking some water before I go to bed. And I just started thinking about what reality is. And I know who I am as a person, like like the the Tony on the inside, not the Tony that I see in the mirror or that people see, but like who I am on the inside, that 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 spirit of of Tony, like the the inner mm -hmm. me. And I started thinking, like, what are the odds that this that that part of me was lucky enough to be placed in in America, in in the situation that I've been put in, when I could just have easily been that 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 Tony, uh, born into a body that was in a deprived third world country and never even know what internet is. 
You know, mm -hmm. it's just like that reality of the, the inner person and the existence of that inner person. And, and then what are the odds of that inner person even experiencing the reality that I see through the eyes that I have? You know, it, right. it's just trippy stuff, man. Well, there is uh, there is a belief uh, in occult philosophy that on each of the planetary spheres, uh, there's actually, um, for lack of a better term, a different astral body of ours that is living simultaneously in different realms of those seven planetary spheres. And that when we are experiencing issues in health or different capacities of our life in different areas of our life we're actually um we're actually experiencing our our other selves and that that's manifesting into this sphere and so uh if one wanted to work on that let's say you had uh i don't know let's say you had a fear of speaking public speaking or something like that well you could actually travel and meet with and discuss with your other self on, uh, let's say, the sphere of Mercury, which is a you know planet in the, of communication, and you would be able to interact with yourself on that sphere, and that would take care and manifest into um, a non-issue here on Earth because you've already dealt with it on the sphere that actually influences and manifests itself here on um, on Earth. Okay, let's talk about our sponsor for today's show, which is Simply Safe. Friends, I've been talking about Simply Safe for quite some time now. And just before I hit record on this recording, I got a notification on my phone that a man shot himself and found some help at the local Turkey Hill. And I say local Turkey Hill because it's literally a mile and a half away from my house. And then just last week, not even a mile away from my house, probably about a half a mile away from my house. There was a gun shooting and there were several people that got injured and one person died. That's the environment that I live in, friends. I live in the freaking hood, apparently. I don't know what's going on around here, but I'm glad that I have Simply Safe in my house and I have that pretty little sign out front saying that we're protected by Simply Safe, pushing people to the next house, and hopefully they're protected by Simply Safe too. I've been talking to my neighbors about Simply Safe. It is a great deal for you guys. Simply Safe has high security trained experts ready whenever you need them. So if something does happen at your house, God forbid, they are there to help you. They know when the house is broken into, they know when the alarm is sound, and they will dispatch police to your house immediately. I'm telling you, friends, for the price, you cannot beat it. Simply Safe is the home security system that everybody should have in their homes. Whether you're a homeowner or somebody who rents an apartment, you can protect your home with Simply Safe. And right now, as my listener, you can save 20% of your Simply Safe security system and get your first month free when you sign up for an interactive monitoring service. Just visit simplysafe.com slash confessionals to customize your system and start protecting your home and family. That's simplysafe.com slash confessionals. So let's talk about some of this cryptid stuff too, okay? Okay. Um, in fact, I'm not even going to spoil it. You just take it away. And <laughs> listen, I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying this. You're a great storyteller. So feel free to take it away. Okay. Well, um, I'm glad you say that because my wife, she's like, oh, my God, your stories go on forever. <laughs> that's, so, well, that's what podcasts are for. So <laughs> she's always like, she's snapping her fingers, hurry it up, hurry it up, get to the point. Um, you know what? Let me. Okay. I'll go to the, I'll go to the cryptid. I'll go to the cryptid, the cryptid part right here. Uh, because this happened uh, also in the Lower Mainland. Um, after we moved from, from Victoria, we moved to sort of a suburb of Victoria, which is called Langford. Uh, we lived on, uh, lived on Souk Road, which was actually a highway. Uh, behind us, we had uh, across, um, you'd hop over the ditch in our backyard, you'd go about two blocks, and there was the, the rodeo the rodeo ring there and the, the Luxton fairgrounds. So anybody can go on Google earth and Google this. So you can sort of get an area of the topographical and ge geographical uh, area. It's grown a lot since, uh, since I was there, it used to be a lot of forest and whatnot. And they've really expanded with townhouse 
and population growth. Um, but when we lived there in the 80s, um, it was uh, it was like your typical 80s movie, sort of, uh, you know, what was that show? Stranger Things. It was kind of like that, you know. Um, everybody rode their bikes everywhere. All the kids knew each other. We'd all, you know, play telephone tag to hook up and go play in the woods uh, in the back of the subdivision or just hang out at the rodeo, whatever. Um, now, my brother one day was, uh, one night, he had, uh, we had grown up in a pretty dysfunctional and abusive home. So my brother was living on the streets there for, for quite some time. And I guess he was about, uh, had to have been about 14 or 15, I think, at the time. And he was just coming back from his girlfriend's place. And that was on Happy Valley Road. Um, um, and I think he was walking towards Souk Road. And the lighting, the lighting on Happy Valley Road was uh, very sparse. Uh, the houses, you know, houses were typically sitting on about an acre of land each, so you had a good distance between neighbors, and the street lights were were distance quite a, a fair ways apart. Anyway, he's walking, he's walking towards Souk Road, and uh, he notices across the street he she sees something large and black, sort of following him from across the street. And so he notices as it as it comes up to one of the street lights, he can make out its form. And uh, he said it looked like a dog. Um, he said its its hind quarters kind of arched down, uh, like a German shepherd would. Um, his front shoulders, he said it was he said it was so big, its front shoulders stood. Um, about the height of a um, the hood of a car, like the uh, like the hood of the engine, not the roof, but like the hood. Um, he said it was broad, about as broad as me. I'm probably about uh, 21, 22 inches wide. Um, a pretty broad. And uh, he said it had very coarse hair, uh, pointy ears. Um, and he said uh, it followed him, and it was uh, he, could, he could see its teeth, and uh, but it didn't have any eye shine or didn't have red eyes, anything scary like that. But he was like, "Well, gee, that's a pretty big dog." And um, so he started getting freaked out because it was it was it was following him and watching, but wouldn't take his gaze off of my brother. And uh, car comes around the bend and uh, gets this thing's attention and uh it bolts it bolts across the street this car hits it hits its uh its hind legs and um it t took off into this into this yard so the guy stops his car he gets out thinking it was uh my brother's dog and he says oh my god i'm, I'm so sorry um I, I i didn't see it i just ran out in front and my brother said that's not my dog i don't, I don't know what it was and the guy says, "Oh my God, it was it was huge." And my brother's like, "Yeah, do you mind if uh, if you give me a ride up the Souk Road?" And he's like, "Yeah, no problem, get in." But before they went in, it actually um, hit the bumper and um, left blood and uh, and left a good sized dent in it uh, as well. Um, shortly, well, I shouldn't say shortly thereafter. Um, a while later. My brother was up in the uh, the rock quarry with two of his friends, and then we're going to camp out up there for the night. And um, they had heard uh, they had heard some some grunting sounds coming from the tree line, and uh, they kind of thought, "Oh, that's kind of odd. Whatever, maybe it was a bear." And so uh, Steve gets up and says, "Well." F this, I'm not sticking around to find out. So Steve leaves. And uh, so my brother and James, they're just sitting there. And uh, they could hear this thing was kind of getting closer, but that was walking faster back and forth 
but it was staying within the tree line. And my brother said, it actually sounded like, because I'd asked him, I said, well, was it a bear? And he said, well, at first I thought it was a bear, but then he said, um, it sounded more like a, like a dog. And um, I guess their, uh, their nerves uh, sort of got the best of them. And James said, forget this, I'm not going to stick around to find out what it was. So they got up and they, they bolted. And uh, as soon as they bolted, uh, my brother said uh, he could hear this thing chasing them and crashing through the bush. Um, and my brother, he said they ran a good, uh, a good three quarters of a mile, a full sprint, and didn't stop until they crossed the main road at the, uh, at the bottom of the rock quarry. Now, one would think, okay, it was a, it was a bear, and right, rightfully so, it could have been. Um, but now, probably about seven years ago, I was listening to another podcast called, uh, uh, what was it, uh, Mysterious Universe. And there was a guy on there, and he was telling a story. He was at a bush party, and uh, he had walked off into the, into the brush a bit to go take a leak. And he noticed about... Uh, he said about 50, 75 meters. He had noticed this upright walking dog, or he think he described as like a werewolf, walk to this old, um, old abandoned, uh, run-down trailer and then walk inside. Okay, cool enough. But then he said where he was from, Langford, British Columbia. So that's why I kind of uh, I I kind of think it all ties in because I went home and told my brother that, and uh, that's what he that's what I kind of tied them all together that maybe this was on those two occasions that he had seen was actually uh, was actually a dog man, and uh, and not something else. Yeah, that's that's pretty incredible. So in one area they have you at least you know of three different occasions where this thing popped up. Mm-hmm. Yep. And and last year again, um uh I had a recurrence, uh, a resurfacing memory, and I never really told any brother. I just told my brother about it actually the other day. Because it's one of those things where you could go, well, it's just my imagination, right? But uh I had a uh, an experience up on the backwoods. Um we all kind of entered the woods from this one uh, this one cul de sac and we everybody would cut through Rogers our, our friend Roger uh, through his backyard and we'd go up into the woods and it was a summer day and uh, most people were either at work or they had gone on vacation. So there was nobody to come out and play. So I was like, well, I'll go up in the backwoods here. I'll just goof around. And so I went up, I don't know, probably about uh, a mile and a mile and a quarter in. And I never usually went that far out unless I was with some of the older kids. And uh, and so I saw the tree stra- uh, uh, the uh, uh, the tree rope, the tree swing. Uh, that was sort of like the boundary for me. I, I knew not to go any further than that because I didn't know the the area very well and I didn't want to get lost. And uh, I remember stopping because getting just this eerie feeling like something was watching me. And it was dead silent, like. Not a bird, not a cricket, not a grasshopper, nothing. And I remember from Boy Scouts thinking, well, if there's a cougar or a bear, you know, you don't want to make any sudden moves, Um, you know, just walk away slowly. So I thought, well, I'll start singing a song, right? So I started singing maybe just to let something know that if it was a bear that I was in the area. And so I started singing. And, uh... Then I start noticing the hair on the back of my neck starts standing up and the hair on my arms starts standing up. And uh, I'm trying to nonchalantly look around and uh, then all of a sudden that voice in my head yells, run. I'm like, oh, I can't run. I don't want whatever there is. You know, that's the last thing you do. That's what they taught us in Boy Scouts. Don't run. Then the voice in my head shouted again, run. So I did. I dropped my stick and... uh, I started running, and I remember I was so scared that uh, my body was trying to cry, 
but I was breathing so hard I couldn't I couldn't um I got a couple whimpers out and that was it it was just run and my heart was beating so fast I could feel it in my eardrums right and uh I sprinted uh, nonstop uh, until I got, like, I could see the ba- Roger's backyard. I could see the tree swing there. And I remember thinking, oh, thank God, there's Roger's yard. I can, I can stop now. And the voice in my head said, don't stop running until you hit the road. Because if it catches you on the road, someone can at least follow your blood trail and they can find your body, which is a, bizarre thought to be going through one's head when you're running in a panic, right? Like it just, I don't know, I guess the brain works in weird ways. Yeah. But I remember I got to the I got to the street in the cul-de-sac, I ran across the street, turned and um, stopped and turned and sat down because at that point my asthma had kicked in and uh, I guess the adrenaline was coming down, it was getting a little hard to breathe. Um but yeah, and I never told anybody because uh, because they would just say, "Oh, well, it was uh, it was your imagination." So could it have been? Yeah, it could have been. Or was it something? You know, did I pick up something or sent something that was in there that uh, it shouldn't have been? Yeah, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Um, you know, with your brother's sighting, the initial one, did, did you ever ask him if it crossed his mind to take? the hair and blood as like a sample? Oh, uh, no. Because he, he, he just thought it was a big dog, right? A, a really big dog. Yeah, so it wouldn't have crossed his mind at that point. In fact, uh, I don't think so. He, according to his experiences, I mean, he, it probably sounds like he would be under the assumption that if anything, it was a wolf, not a dog man. And you're the one time the connection between his experiences and the guy who had seen the dog walking upright. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I mean, the the only thing that that um, that made him not think it was a wolf or a dog was the sheer size of it. Um, the fact that its front that its front shoulder blades were as high as they were, um, and then and how broad it was. He said the thing was like as as broad as like a linebacker. So. And he had never seen any dog like that, even even large. Like we've had friends that uh, raised boxers and uh, German shepherds, and never seen anything that big. Yeah. But it wasn't. But it, you know, when it crossed the street, it was. He he said it was on all fours. He he didn't see it get up on on two feet or anything like that. But he was just amazed at the sheer size of it, um, with with its shoulder blades being the height that they were. Now, did you ever bring it up to him about the possibility of it being a dog man? Hmm. Yeah, um, and actually, I had gone on the net and I had looked around for some pictures of dogmen, and there was uh, there was one uh, that I showed him, and he said it looked exactly like that, except it was on all fours, not standing up. Wow, wow! So yeah. I guess he's a believer then. He's he's down for this this narrative. He actually he's he's not. He's kind of like well, it, it could be whatever. Um, he doesn't he hasn't followed the dogman at all. Um, I prefer, I prefer not to because I like the outdoors. Yeah, and quite frankly, it scares the hell out of me. <laughs> yeah. And I think about it before I go on a hike. It, it's it kind of puts a damper on what could be a good trip. Yeah, that's understandable for sure. Uh, yeah. y- you should just say to him, "Bro, we were abducted." <laughs> like, <laughs> do you not remember our childhood? <laughs> well, and, and you know the funny thing is, I, I told them I, I I had actually looked up a number of years ago. Uh, somebody for uh, for some regressive therapy, right? That would that would do it uh, to try and uh, regress our, our experience. And he says, I don't. He, he said, I don't want to know. I don't want to know what happened. But he says, if you want to go and le- and and find out for me, uh, then you're more than welcome. But he he wanted he he wants no part of 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 any recollection. He just wants to let it, let it lie. Did you ever go? Mm-mm. Why? I think because maybe I don't want to know. Like, you know, what's what's done and done. I, I I can't go. I can't go back and change it. And do I want to deal with resurface memories that maybe are best left undone? 
you know, and not knowing about. Yeah, I can understand that for sure. So, I mean, that, that, that curiosity is always there. Um, but part of me is like, you know, I, can I live with that memory that I have right now? Yes. Do I want to live with the potential memories of what may have happened? I, I don't think so because, you know, with my, with my last experience with what they did to me, um, that, that was, that was terrifying. Um, and I don't, and, and, and I have a hard enough time dealing with that, that small memory alone of, of, of when I was taken into that beam of light. Um, I, I know I don't want to, I don't want to have to deal with another memory on top of that one. If it was anything like that, I don't want to. I don't want to deal with that. That's understandable. That's understandable. In fact, I think I would be in the same shoes. I, I if that something like that happened to me, I don't know if I'd want to remember anything outside my natural memory. Uh, that's understandable. Uh, it's funny because like some people, they're all about the regression therapy. They're, they're like, yeah, I want to know. And then some people are just like, nah, let let it let it go. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And it's, um, and it's completely understandable. I mean, you know, when I was younger, um. I was like, yeah, that might might be something to do, you know. I was into like, you know, the past life regression and stuff like that too, uh, and whether that is subjective or whatever else, I don't know. But the experiences that I've had thus far, to me, that's enough. I don't, I don't need any more clarification. Would it be nice to know, you know, what their purpose was, or if there was a plan, or you know, sort of the long term goals? Sure, but what if it was something other that was. Uh, more um maleficent right malicious yeah. i mean yeah and and that's the thing i mean you, you might find out something you wish you didn't know and, uh-huh. uh, yeah and, and who knows what that does to your mental state i mean you find something out you wish you didn't know maybe there's a reason why you didn't remember it and who knows maybe you wind up going crazy you know uh yeah, yeah. that's right yeah i i totally get it i totally get it now um that was your brother's experience but you have some pretty scary experience in the wood as well in the woods as well. Um, yeah, we've had, um, I don't know. Uh, are you, I can't remember what, what notes I had sent you. Uh, Tony, is there something specific that you were making reference to on that one? No, because you didn't, you didn't go into specifics. You had told me that it told me the, the, the experiences we went into. And then you had said that you, and you have your own personal experiences in the woods and, then mm-hmm. I know when we were talking beforehand, before we went live, you mentioned about the Bigfoot. So I assumed that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll go into the, I'll go into the Bigfoot one. Um, Are there others other than Bigfoot that you want to talk about? Cause we could do that too. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, there are, there's some, uh, some other interesting, not, not so much uh, scary, but some interesting um, when I'd gotten into magic, uh, and just experiences in the woods with that. Okay. Um, but I'll, I'll go into the Bigfoot. Uh, we have a, we, we, a couple of years ago, I guess three or four years ago now, we bought a, uh, an RV lot in an RV resort uh, property uh, up in Harrison Hot Springs. And anybody that does Bigfoot research knows that Harrison is a Bigfoot hub. So usually... They shut off the water, usually uh, end of November, and then they turn the water back on, depending on how the weather is, uh, mid-February, beginning of March. So we like to go up there as soon as they open open the resort, and there's usually nobody there, but it's nice to get away from the city and just go up and chill out. And so... Uh, we got a large gazebo, and I like to hang my hammock up, and then I'll I'll sleep in my hammock, even if it's you know minus zero, or or close to it. I'll sleep outside, and the kids and the wife they sleep in the RV. And um, so the first couple of years that we've been there, and last year in particular, um, I was woken up, I don't know, probably about two o'clock, two thirty in the morning. To the screaming, I was like, "What the hell is that?" But this was this was in the distance, in the mountains, and uh, and I was like, "Man, that's real, that's that's a really that's a really odd scream." But it was almost like a mix between a scream and like a howl. And um, 
And so last year, uh, I'm sleeping out there, and it wakes me up. And actually, my, my youngest was sleeping in the hammock next to me. And uh, she didn't hear it. She was fast asleep. But it repeated it about four or five times. And I kick myself now because I had a, I had a sleep app on my, on my phone. And I'm going to do it this year when I, uh, when I go back up. And basically, it's an app you run in the background. And if there's any noise, it picks it up and records it. So I'm going to do that this year when we go back out next month. Um, but I went, I went on YouTube, and uh, I, could, I found the same, the same howls that others had recorded sounded just like that, but like maybe like the pitch was a little different. And, uh, and I was like, holy, holy cow, that's, uh, this is what I've heard for the last three years. Um, and so I brought it up to our neighbor behind us. And uh, I said, hey, you know, I, I heard these howls along with another ghostly experience I'll, I'll bring up later. Um, and she said, well, you know, it's funny you mention that because when they were up, she had heard that same sort of howling, screaming out in the green space um, in our RV resort. And, and so she got out and listened to it. She was like, oh, that's odd. I wonder, I wonder what that is. So she got talking to a uh, to another another person that was there, that was staying there. And he happened to actually work on the power lines up in the back mountains there, right behind our resort. And apparently he had said that... Um, when they were working on the power lines up in the back, instead of going into town uh, to sleep uh, at the hotels, uh, they would camp out up there. But I, I guess they had some experiences up there where nobody camps up there, spends the night up there anymore, and none of them will even bring their families to camp up in those mountains anymore because of what they had seen. So we definitely have Bigfoot in that area that I've physically heard. Um, my neighbors have heard it. And uh, and the one guy obviously worked up there on the crew up on the power lines. And uh, they've experienced the same thing. So they don't, uh, they don't go up there anymore either. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's kind of like a, uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm missing a word here, but it, it, the whole area knows about this. Mm-hmm. Well, and you know, the funny thing is, from a from a topographical standpoint, I can see why it would be favorable habitat for creatures like that, because all of the mountains, they're sitting on like a 65 degree slope, eh? All, all of them, all around. They're like super, super steep mountains. So if, if, if anybody was to ever seen one or tried to pursue it, it would be next to impossible. Your, your legs wouldn't be able to keep up with it. It's too steep. The terrain is too rough. You just wouldn't be able to do it. So let me ask you a question. It's kind of off topic in the sense that I'm looking mm -hmm. for your opinion on this. Um, when it comes to Bigfoot, the dog man that, that uh, you shared about, and even the um, abduction, do you think that all these things are related in some way? Because I know there's a lot of people that believe that Bigfoot is alien and, and Dogman might be alien or whatever. Uh, do you get that sense? Or do you think that these are all different categories of creatures? You no, know, that's a tough one. Um, I think with some of the stuff that I've heard from Bigfoot, um, it almost sounds like an interdimensional thing. Um, I think the dog man, and I don't want to go too off topic here with the hollow earth, but with the amount of sightings and whatnot coming from coming with dog man over, I'd say like the last 15 years or so, I'm almost, I almost think something like that could have come from, from hollow earth. Um, and then when these, because what were those, do you remember in England, I think they called them like the green kids or something like that. Oh yeah. What is that? It, remember that story? Those yeah. two, those two kids who come up, um, it wasn't Edinburgh, but it was something like that. They came up, those, those two green kids showed up in that, that village in England and they said that they had come from, they had, they had gotten lost and they, they ended up up here. 
So it had me thinking, I'm wondering, and not just Dogman, but of uh, uh, various cryptids, what if the same thing happens to those cr- those cryptid creatures or, or things that we see as cryptids, whether they be chupacabra or whatever, um, and these are things that have stumbled out and found their way up here. It's really interesting. Yeah, I, and I just looked it up for clarification because it was going to drive me nuts. Uh, Wolf, <laughs> <laughs> the the Green Children of Woolpit. Uh, it, it's, there you go. it's in England. Yeah, that that I, I when you said that, I was like, oh my gosh, I remember that. I remember hearing about that. But uh, yeah, I mean that's 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 a, a good point. I mean, I, I know a lot of people think about Bigfoot coming from Hollow Earth and uh, you know coming from within the Earth. It, it makes sense, and mm-hmm. just to, if you just boil it down to take the the term Hollow Earth out of it. Um, if these creatures are real, where do they live? Well, I mean, maybe they, they have access to the cave system. I mean, mm-hmm. um, I know in Pennsylvania, into Ohio, there's a lot of sightings of Bigfoot. And there's also a lot of caves in Pennsylvania, tons right. of caves. There's right. there's so many caves in Pennsylvania. I can almost guarantee you there's caves that we have that haven't had a human being in them for you know, hundreds of years. There's just, there's tons and some of them are tiny and some of them are absolutely huge. And, uh, it, it's just one of those things where maybe they have access to it. You know, I don't know, but it's something to think about. Well, yeah. And the other thing too, right. If you take a look at a dog, man, if it has this, the keen sense of smell as, as dogs do, well, it would be able to follow its way back to where it came from. And if it, and if it can come back and forth, you know, ends up in a national park or something up here well the hunting's good the eating's good what would stop it from going back and grabbing some of its friends or its pack members and bringing them back too which would explain yeah. possibly the uh the the rise in sightings and here's another theory this is kind of you know off you know, a little bit of an offshoot but um so in pennsylvania there's uh, there's a very well-known deep underground military base called Raven Rock. I've talked about it on the show before. Uh, mm-hmm. But a lot of people think that there's at least two in Pennsylvania. Some people swear there's two in Pennsylvania, but I have not yet found anybody to tell me where the second location is, which is like a personal mis- mission of mine. Uh, but I theorize <sighs> that maybe if there is a second one, it would be in the Allegheny National Forest because it's government property. And right. literally the forest takes up probably about between one eighth to one sixteenth of the state. I mean, it's absolutely huge. Holy cow! And so, if these things, it, what if what if these things are designed? You know, they're 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 mm-hmm. they're designed chimera type creatures by you know, sick mad scientists, and they're doing it deep underground, and these things come out to do their thing. And I I think uh, I, I've heard different stories of like of that nature and then them having some kind of callback device where if you i don't know just hit a button these things are programmed to return to to where they came from very interesting stuff well and it's funny you say that too because there have been sightings uh where people have said that they they see these dogmen and they're wearing like body armor right um and there was there was a show on netflix i think it was called um Love, Sex, Robots, or Love, Sex, and Robots, I think. And it was a series of um, episodes that were animated episodes, right? Different things. And uh, and one of them was about dogman soldiers in Afghanistan. So that was, you know, maybe you're onto something. Maybe they are designed, or like you said, like a chimera, chimeric mutation perhaps. Yeah. And they're using them for the military. I don't know. You know, it's funny you bring up Afghanistan and that whole thing because, uh, one, I've heard that lots of times. And again, I brought him up earlier in the show, my friend, Mr. X Dreams. He was a soldier and I believe he said it was Afghanistan, Afghanistan or Iraq, but I, I leaned towards Afghanistan. And he told a story of looking through his, uh, I guess, binoculars or whatever. And he sees a man on like a motorbike going down a road and he's observing. And these two giant dogs came running out right alongside of the guy. And uh, I, I forget how the story ended, but the, I, the guy got away. But it was like he said they were abnormally large. Like he said, they were huge. And uh, so it, it, it kind of goes along with what you just said. You see, I don't want to go backpacking anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 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 Yeah. So I was going to say to my, my brother on, on a side note. 
He's also had two other cryptid sightings of, uh, uh, I guess uh, they would be called uh, Cadbarosaurus, or like Loch Ness Monster Sea Serpents. Um, he had them uh, when our grandparents were in hospice. They lived in Parksville. His first one he saw when he was at Duke Point having a smoke, and he was looking down in the small cove, and he saw what he thought was a log, about 40 feet long, and, uh, yeah, he said, he, he said he, he saw it, and it kind of disappeared, and then it came back up underneath a, uh, a school of seagulls, tried to grab one, but he said, he said it moved like a snake, but up and down instead of sideways. He said it had the head that looked like, now this is bizarre, but <clears throat> he said it had the head that looked like a horse. And he said it, its its back tail, its back fin looked like the, like that of a goldfish. And uh, <clears throat> he works up at the UBC hospital up here at the University of British Columbia. And he talked to a professor who had written a book on Cadborosaurus, actually. And uh, he had put my brother in contact with another woman whom he had interviewed for his book. And she had seen the exact same thing. She was... Um, she was doing uh, in the Gulf in in the Georgia Strait. She was um, uh, researching the migratory pa um, migratory patterns of uh, the orcas out here, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, she had something that, that exact same uh, same size, same description. Passed no more than uh, swim right beside her, ten feet ten feet beside her, swim right past her, and uh, <clears throat> she surfaced and she hasn't been in the water since. Uh, I understand totally. Holy crap. It, what you just described, it sounds like what I picture in my head is one of those uh, 1400s paintings that the sailors did after they crossed the Atlantic Ocean and they talk about the sea creatures they saw. You know, that's kind of what you just described. Yeah, it's it's totally bizarre, right? Like, I'm like, it had the head of a horse. He says, yeah, that's the best way I could describe it. He said it, it, its head was about almost three feet long. And he said it looked it looked hairy like a horse head. Like, wow, geez, that's absolutely bizarre. Yeah, and then he saw it a second time uh, when he was up in Parksville because my grandparents had a house on the beach, and he was uh, he was uh, sitting there looking out from the because um, my grandparents always kept a, a pair of binoculars on the windshield ledge there. We'd look at eagles and whales that would pass by, and yeah, he saw he saw the same thing. Swim right out in front of their house there, out there in the ocean. Wow. that's What are the odds of seeing it twice, you know? Uh, well, yeah. That, that's incredible. That's absolutely incredible. Yeah, totally bizarre. So, I mean, there's definitely lots of things out there, man, that uh, we'll, be, we'll be finding, I'm sure, or, or discovering hundreds of years from now. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, we, we've... We've discovered a lot in the last few hundred years that people thought was fiction. And I can only imagine, you know, especially as technology grows and you're able to kind of research things on a technological level more, I imagine, you know, more things will surface. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, Joel, or, or Joel, I keep wanting to say Joel. Uh, <laughs> Joel, do you, would you want to stay over for an overtime segment to talk more about your... Of course, uh, yeah. Yeah, because I want to talk to you more about your uh, experiences. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about the magic there, uh, but just for the audience to to know where you're coming from, just give them a brief snippet as to um, you know what we're going to cover in the overtime segment. Well, um, as I've written you before, um, I actually I uh, when I was younger, I had experienced a lot of paranormal and uh, what I would call uh, at the time demonic activities and hauntings uh, and I actually wanted to grow up and, and be a pastor I was actually training um, to be a Sunday school teacher at the time uh, and I eventually through my experiences um, uh, decided to jump into magic both feet to the fire uh, so I could find out for myself, you know, what I was being taught was was wrong and evil, and I wanted clarification for my own experiences um, to find out what was going on um, from a first-hand account, as opposed to a, a, a preacher or a pastor telling me what I was supposed to believe um, from the pulpit. So, uh, yeah, I go into that more more later. What made me decide to. Uh, what I what I call from the uh, from the cross to the crossroads, I guess, um, and follow a path of witchcraft as opposed to that of becoming a uh, 
a pastor in the Christian faith. Yeah. And so we're going to get into that in the overtime segment. And obviously you and I have differences there. And uh, mm-hmm. we talked about it before the interview to make sure we were both okay talking about these kind of things together. <laughs> and just wanted to make sure you weren't going to cast spells on me and stuff. So, <laughs> but no, 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 I don't do that, man. Yeah, I got, I got you, man. But uh, yeah. So Joel, thanks for joining me on this first half of the show, man. It's been really an interesting conversation, man. It's been a pleasure, Tony. Well, that's the show, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy, please share the show with your friends. I don't care where or how you share the show. Just share the show if you enjoyed it. And just a reminder, we are doing a whole other hour with Joel in the overtime for members where he talks about him being a witch and pursuing witchcraft, his experiences doing that. And some of these stories that he has are mind blowing. Like it was, I'm just telling you, it was an awesome conversation. And if you're a member, I know you're going to love it. So head on over to the overtime show. And for the rest of you, until next week, stay safe, take care. And remember, the truth will set you free. But first, it'll piss you off. Bye. So I was having a lucid experience. Um, I was I was put forth um, with the the task of protecting uh, some kids in a situation. Um, I had to deal with a number of uh, <laughs> absolutely um, terrifying demonic entities. We'll we'll say. Um, and like I'm talking, I've I've never had night terrors before. I'd had bad dreams before. But I never, I never had night terrors until I started practicing witchcraft. This was uh, probably this was like my first night terror. It was absolutely terrifying. Um, anyway, um, at the end of it, I ended up. Um, I saw this this man in black was on this hill, and he was he was outside overlooking what was going on. And after I had dealt with these entities. I went up to the hill, and I, I was pissed. I was I was freaking livid, and uh, I got up in his face, and he simply smiled. He didn't. He simply smiled, and he said, "Now, now you're ready to talk." And I said, "What?" He said, "Now you're ready to talk." I said, "I don't want to fucking talk to you. What you just put me through." And he just had a smile on his face, and he disappeared. I thought, what the hell was that all about? Oh, well, it wasn't until several months later um, that I was I was reading that that is one of his ways that he manifests is as a man in black, and what that that uh, huh, that episode that I had gone through that night terror that I had just experienced was him testing me. To see whether or not I was ready to go on to the next level. Hey, thanks for watching The Confessionals on YouTube. If you like what you heard, hit the subscribe button, hit the share button, and hit the like button. That would be a great help to me. And if you want more of The Confessionals on a weekly basis, every Thursday I come out with a special show just for members on my website. So if you want to check that out, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button, and become a member today. And every Thursday, you'll get a new show, and you can binge on previous shows, which there's almost a 100 of them. So if you love the show, go ahead and check it out. But thank you very much for being here on YouTube and checking out the channel.